I just want to say we had church already. <laughs> Walking in here, you know, the Bible says that God looks for those who worship him in spirit and truth. Yes. That God enjoys being around those people. So when I came in here with all these people, I know it wasn't just for the turkey food outside that Tristan brought. <laughs> but I could feel the presence of God and the anointing coming from just pure hearts loving God and loving each other. The Bible says whether two or three gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. In fact, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. It means God just sits down and says, hey, let's hang out together. So you came all this way this morning, not just for that good food outside, I'm trying to not smell. But you came because Father God wants to sit down with you and say, you know what, I got some good stuff for your life. I'm going to show you who you really are. I'm going to show you a purpose and a destiny for you and for your families. Now, the word testimony in Hebrews, one of the words is to do again, right? So we just heard from this brave man to get up and share his testimony about overcoming things in his life. And it takes an openness and a boldness to do that. But hey, you can be real. You can try to pretend you're okay. He got up and shared not only did God do something, but he's continuing to do something in his life. Amen. Then we hear from this beautiful family here about God moving in the relative's life. You know, uh, I'll share a testimony of my own. I got inspired. So I work at a psychiatric treatment center for young people with psych disorders. Little kids to teenagers who have problems. Now some of them have demons, and some of them maybe they just are crazy. I don't know. I'll ask God one day when I get to heaven. But it's, it's, my job is just the recreation director, which is I get up like, hey, you guys want to play soccer today? Do you want to exercise? Yes, we'll exercise, but you got to give us candy, which is counterintuitive. <laughs> So get them to exercise, give them Takis and ice cream after lunch. But years ago, I worked at this small church in Wharton, Texas. And in Wharton, Texas, most people don't know, Wharton is not country, it's the hood. And there was a family of people who were kind of infamously rough in Wharton, Texas. And one of the family members came to church and I was preaching and began to cry like a baby. I was preaching on the love of God. And this gentleman began to cry like a baby and said, you know what, I need that love in my life. He became saved and he quit the life that he was living that was not a good life. And apparently a lot of people in his family thought he had lost his mind. And a lot of people from that background did not like that he had just decided to leave the life he had been in. So somebody came to his house and said, you know what, my car broke down. Can you give me jumper cables and jump my car? He said, sure, let me send my kids inside. He said the kids inside, when he turned around, they shot him at point black range in the back, at least six or seven times. And they took him to the hospital, and they didn't know if he was going to live. And his whole family was there, and they were kind of all mad at everything. And one of the brothers who was there was like, God, my brother was living on these streets and never had no problems. And now he starts living for you and going to church, and he got shot. What sort of God are you? And all his brother could keep saying through his breath is God is good, God is good. So I'm in El Campo, Texas, and I get a phone call, hey, that member of your church is in downtown Houston, he's been shot, he's in the medical center, they don't know if he's gonna live, can you go pray for him? I'm like, yeah, so I jump out of bed, put on my clothes, get my Bible, I'm running over there, not knowing all of his banger family members are in the hospital room. <laughs> the only gringo in the room with a bunch of chulos. Who were muy enojado, they're angry, they were not happy. So here comes me walking out of the room for my guy, and all these people turn around looking at me, giving me the death look. <laughs> and there was a level of you could be intimidated, but God had sent me on a mission to pray for this man. I began to pray for him, and I don't tell people unless I know that I know I've heard from God. I said, He's gonna live, he's not gonna die. He's gonna live, he's gonna live. I speak life over him, he's gonna live. They all kind of got shocked. One of the guys teared up and just began to release the love of God in the room. The Holy Spirit began to hit all the guys in the room. The man, who they said they didn't know if he was going to live or not, lived. He had a bullet that was stuck in his body that could have drifted into his heart or into his um, other organs. The bullet just miraculously pushed itself out. So the brother who'd been saying, God, where are you, went with the brother who'd been shot to church the next Sunday and became a believer. <laughs> So I work at a psychiatric treatment center. Hadn't seen this gentleman in about four or five years. He needs a job. He's worked in childcare before, so he had a friend who said, you need to go check this place out. It's a good place, they treat you good. He's like, well, God, I'm praying about it, but I'm kind of nervous because I don't know anybody there. And so he's walking with my friend, the chaplain, through the doors, and look who I see who looks like a giant Samoan. It's my buddy. 
And he didn't recognize me. And I was like, dude, it's you. And he's like, pastor, it's you. We bear hug in the middle of the room in front of all these little kids. <laughs> to see a man who my first experience with him was in a hospital room praying for his brother, five years later, still living for God, still loving people. Let me tell you something. You never know who you're praying for. Right. You never know who you're ministering to. Even the tough cases in your family. The Bible says God said he would save your whole household. I want to just encourage you. Your life is a living witness. You know, you can go to pray for somebody in a nursing home, hospital room, like the brothers and sister here did with a relative. That love speaks to people. And this is what it's all about. Now, if we have our Bibles, let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians 9.5. I am in a series on marriage and family. Because, uh, you know, as Christians, a lot of times we're very good about talking about spiritual things, which are good. You know, casting out demons and dreams and visions and interpretations. And that stuff's good. But the Bible also has a lot to say about love each other. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your uh, husbands. Children, obey and honor your parents. So the Bible is a spiritual book, but it's also a book of wisdom which can show you how to do things. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll get as far as we can go. This marriage and family series, we'll talk about money. Everybody likes talking about money. We'll talk about uh, sex and family. It's how you grow the children's church. <laughs> you know, because unfortunately the world takes something good that God made and perverts it. You know, it, it, when the confines of the Bible, what the Bible says, it's a wonderful thing. And then the world just gives a lie to people that's not even true. But 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, and we're going to start in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 9, 5. Therefore, I thought it was necessary to exhort, which exhort is another word for encourage, the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you previously promised. It may be ready as a matter of generosity and not a matter of grudging obligation. But I say this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. But I also say this, God loves a cheerful giver, but doesn't say he doesn't love one who's not cheerful. <laughs> if you cry over your offering, it's watering your seed. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you've sown, increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you're enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving for us towards God. For the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through this proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience, the confession of the gospel, for your liberal sharing with all men. And that by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for this incredible gift. So Paul's writing this church at the time, and all the churches at this time were suffering different degrees of persecution. But the church in Jerusalem it was really bad. The Romans hated these people. They were violently persecuted. The Jews basically had to work with each other. They didn't work with Gentiles, but if you became a Christian and were a Jew, they said, you know what, you can't work with us anymore, so you couldn't work or eat. So it was very hard to be a Jewish believer in Jerusalem or in Israel. So Paul and all the churches got together and said, you know what, there's a famine, we're going to take care of the brothers in Jerusalem, we're going to send them something. And Paul's like, I'm very confident that you guys are going to be generous, that we don't even have to worry, you guys have the gift ready. It's like, you know, we have that gift of the food outside there. You know, there's just a confidence that they're going to give. And he says, listen, if you give this gift, there's a lot of good things that are going to happen. But first, I want you to know, give as you purpose in your heart. Here's the thing. As a believer, don't let somebody manipulate you into giving. Give because you love the Lord. Now, tithing should be a given. That's like a given. Like, you should feed your wife and kids if you're a man. <laughs> if, if okay, if you're a parent, you should feed your child. That should not be like, oh, your kids are fasting. No, you feed your kids. That's a given. <laughs> I tell the kids in my job, it is a given. Every day we gotta brush our teeth and put on deodorant. This is what you do as a human being. You cannot come here with bo. There's just certain things you do. 
Well, as a Christian, tithing is just saying, you know what, God, I trust you with my life. You're the source of everything good that I have. So I'm going to give my tithe. Then, above and beyond that, is the offerings. And saying, you know what, God, okay, you've been good to me. I'm going to bless the church or I'm going to bless other people. But it says don't do that because you feel like you have to. Do that because you love the Lord and you trust him. You know, because, listen, God will still bless you anyway, but why not just enjoy being a blessing? <laughs> you know, now sometimes we, we might have to give out of, <laughs> you know, uh, trust. There was a young guy at Bible school that I used to work at years ago. And I was visiting the Bible school and I actually preached there for them a couple of services. And he's getting ready to do a children's service with a thousand little kids. That's a lot of little kids. <laughs> and he was in the bookstore at our Bible school saying, oh, God, I want this one specific Bible. I just need a Bible. This Bible is being held together by duct tape. And I was like, oh, Lord, that kid needs a Bible. And God says, Bible, Bible. I was like, oh, Lord, I mean, <laughs> let's talk about this guy. <laughs> it wasn't just any Bible. It was like a very nice study Bible God told me to give him. I was like, Lord, you know they got those good news paperbacks, you father? <laughs> You know, I'm negotiating with Father God. Because I had not had a lot of money at that time either. And God told me to do it. And I, with tears down my face, not because I was so moved to give the kid the Bible, because I'm thinking I'm giving away the last thing I have. Give this young man the Bible. You know, and he's excited, and he preached, and I went home. And when I got home, there was a check in the mail for three times the amount the Bible was worth. Because sometimes God likes a cheerful giver, but he'll take a cry and see too. It's about your heart being obedient to him. And he wants to show you, I'm faithful. I'm faithful. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. It says heaven and earth can pass away, but not one tittle, which is a half a stroke of a period in the Bible, will fail you. You don't have to trust the lottery. You don't have to do no scratch offs. You don't have to go play the stock market. You have a father in heaven who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and it says it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's his good pleasure. He's happy to bless you. Because you trust him. So give as you purpose in your heart. Don't do it out of manipulation, but do it because you love the Lord and want to be obedient. And every person's at a different level in life. What is, you could just be $40 for one person is $40 million for somebody else. So it's not about necessarily the quantity. It's about your heart connected to it. Don't compare yourself to other people. You just do what God told you to do. Amen. Don't do it grudgingly now out of necessity. And it says God's able to make all grace. What does it mean? Grace is the favor of God, but it's also the ability of God. Abound towards you that you would be sufficient for everything and have an abundance for every good work. When you go to work, he gives you favor, he gives you ability. When you go to school, he gives you favor, he gives you ability. When you're at home with your children, he gives you favor, he gives you ability. You have grace abounding in every area of your life. People look at you and say, why are you different? Because you got grace abounding and working in you. Why do you stand out? Because the grace of God is in your home. It's in your life. It's everywhere you go. Why did a car miss you when you were in traffic? Because the grace of God is abounding in your life. Grace abounding everywhere. What I love about this, it says, he dispersed abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. How do you leave a legacy? Loving people. Amen. What is a way to show that you love people? By giving. People won't remember what you gave, but they'll know that you cared. And you showing, being obedient, and showing acts of love speaks louder than a hundred good words. I remember one time when I was a kid, my mom had, had faced a horrible health situation. My dad was working seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day. He would just come home to sleep. And we'd been going to this little church, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. And these little church mamas and little tias were at the door. And they brought us barracho beans, tortillas, fajitas, and they started cleaning my mama's house and folding the clothes and left us uh, a gift card to go to H-E-B or Walmart for whatever we needed. And my mom didn't want to take it. She's crying. I'm like, no, sister, we love you. We got to give it to you. You're our family. I never forget those ladies. Even the unbelievers in my family don't forget those ladies. Because at the end of the day, it's not about necessarily what type of thing you gave. It's the act of love that most people in the world don't do. You showing that love, the righteousness endures forever. My nieces and nephews who are raised by unbelievers know about these ladies. You showing love matters more than necessarily what you give. 
it lasts forever. And it says, and he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to the food will multiply the seed you've sown, increase the fruits of your righteousness, which causes thanksgiving for us towards God. In other words, people see your acts of love and begin to say, you know what, there is a God. You know what, for these people to love each other, there is a God. Jesus said, all you know, you're my disciples by your love for each other. Yes. It's proof of the ministry. It causes blessings. Now, I'm going to give you a few more points. And then we're going to dismiss. And if you need prayer after church, after we dismiss, we'll pray for you. we got food, a lot of other good stuff happening. But if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, excuse me. Chapter 3. Verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7. And to give y'all guys a little backdrop on this, Paul had been preaching about the return of Jesus Christ. The church in Thessalonica was being so persecuted, they decided the rapture was happening today. It was the end times. It was the Antichrist. So they're like, okay, this is so bad. It's the end of the world. So what happened is people would be like, you know, Brother Chesley, uh, since Jesus is coming back anyway, I'm going to quit my job, and you got to feed me. <laughs> they're like, well, wait a minute. This is not how this works. If Jesus is coming back, you need to work till he comes back. And so it was causing problems in the church. So Paul addresses this in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7. He says, for you yourselves know you ought to follow us as our example. For we were not disorderly among you. We did not eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because as apostles we don't have authority to ask for offerings, but to make ourselves examples of how you should follow us. For even when we're with you, we commanded you, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear there are some among you who are in a disorderly manner, not working at all, and are busy bodies. Now those who are such as we command and exhort for our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness, and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good and sharing. So it says in, in the book of Proverbs, those who don't work, do not eat. Now we got a lot of people, my friends from Cuba, my coach in wrestling from Cuba, his first question when he would meet you, Nay Hernandez, you're a communist man. Because Nay did not like the socialistas. <laughs> but I know Nay, I'm not a communist, I love America. Here's the thing, a lot of young people nowadays, they're writing books defending Marxism with an illusion that you don't have to do anything, we can all just be rich. Well, if nobody works, nobody eats. They're, they write books about how much they don't like rich people. I said, listen, I don't hate rich people, I just wanna be one too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God blesses the work of your hands, he doesn't bless your blessed shirt sitting down doing nothing. Now, if you have a medical disability or some other situation, we're not talking about you. But we're talking about people who say, I refuse to work and I want people to give me stuff for free. I'm like, no, I didn't even, I didn't even lose my job and they gave me a stimulus check, so I gave my stimulus check away. Praise the Lord. Yes. <laughs> it's like, why do I need this when I, I'm blessed that I got a job the whole time? So as a believer, we work hard, God blesses your hands, but don't give in to the lie that they're preaching nowadays that you know what, we need universal basic income or we need this or that. Because if you take people's purpose away, they don't work as hard. That's right. My friends from you know Venezuela and Cuba can tell you if a doctor makes as much as a janitor, why would you try to be a doctor? Right. <laughs> Being a janitor is a lot more easy, a lot less stress. Right. So there is a reward system that's good. And listen, God will bless you, but he blesses the work of your hands. It says in Deuteronomy, whatever God give, gives you, this is the good thing about being a believer is, it says, whatever you put your hands to shall prosper. The fruit doesn't fail to produce uh, in its time. So whatever job you got, you could be a janitor, you could work at H-E-B, you could be in any industry. God will cause you to rise above the rest and bless the work of your hands where they're like, we want to bless you. We want to give you an increase doesn't matter. God doesn't care about your title. He cares about you. Right. Amen. But God won't reward laziness, especially as a man. He's like, eh, I don't want to work. I mean, 
I was an associate pastor at church and so many dudes would let their wife go work two jobs and they just stay home and do nothing. Like there is no such thing in the Bible as a stay at home daddy. No. no, get up and do something. I don't care what you do. Be the best reader at Walmart. I'm happy for you. <laughs> you know, I don't care what you do. You could be laying bricks or building anything. God will bless it, but be willing to do something. But what I cannot put up with as a believer is some man who has legs that work, backs that work, hands that work, and he won't work. Sha, sha, sha. No, 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 no. It's not how it goes. <laughs> not how it goes. The Bible says, he who does not provide for his own is worse than an infidel. <laughs> so get up and do something lest you do nothing in Jesus' name. Amen. God blesses your work. Now, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 6, and then we're going to hit a couple of scriptures. My last point, God blesses tithing. He blesses the work of your hands. Proverbs chapter 6, we'll go to verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, no overseer or ruler, Provides her supplies in the summer, gathers her food in the harvest. How long, O oh slugger, will you rise from your sleep? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and poverty comes upon you like a prowler, and your needs like an armed man trying to rob you. Now let's go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 25. Proverbs 30, 25. He blesses tithing. Your giving leads a legacy that blesses other people. The ants are not a people. The ants are not a strong people. Proverbs 30, 25. Yet they prepare their food in the summer. And then the book of Proverbs, I'll just quote it to you, chapter 27, verse 7, verse uh, 5. Let's see. It says the ant saves its food for the time of famine. So, all these examples, because a lot of times in church we do talk about giving, that's important. Tithing is important, but God's also about saving. In other words, the ant saves up for another day. A lot of times in life we get money, we spend money, because nobody teaches us biblical principles. Here's what I would encourage you to do as a believer give your tithes to God. Give offerings. If you have debt, take time to pay off your debt, but also save money. In other words, tithe to yourself. Just put a little bit back each month for a rainy day. I like what Dave Ramsey teaches. I have a lot of people who don't know that Dave Ramsey is actually a Christian, Financial Peace University. But one of the things that he teaches is, you know what, start off with saving yourself $1,000 for an emergency. And once you get to that, try to save up a month's worth of money for your bills. But once you do that, graduate to save up six months of money for your bills. Because the principle is being prepared for that time of adversity. The Bible says if you fail the day of adversity, your strength is small. So in other words, it's preparing for those times. You might say, Chesley, I haven't done that yet. Well, you can start. Yep. Yep. Then God will bless it. That's considered work. He's not against it. Saving money is good. Mm -hmm. Hoping for the scratch off is not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. A couple of years back, somebody gave me one of those scratch-off things. I didn't even know what it was. He's like, I'll just give it to you. Have fun. And I scratched it off for one hundred dollars He was upset. They gave it to me. <laughs> That's the one and only time I ever did anything like that. But there are people who live like that, who unfortunately, not bad folks, but I worked at a convenience store, Bucky's, and would see people give away hundreds of dollars for beer, cigarettes, and lotto tickets. Then they'd just be struggling. Well, instead, Get rid of all that junk and put money into yourself. Put money into your savings. Save some money. Let God bless the work. Let God give you wisdom what to invest in. Of course, the kingdom. But then two, give to your church. Love God. Give to people. But give to yourself. Save it for another day. I call it the joy of delayed gratification. I could spend this money, but I'm going to save this money. I'm not going to eat my money on Blue Bell and new shoes. <laughs> I could shop at Ross and still fund the revival. I don't have to shop at Marshall's every day. Praise the Lord. You know, 
I got some friends from Monterey, they like to do the elbow because they're great at negotiating stuff in Monterey. They say they're great at negotiating. No, they're cheap. But they are proud. If they got something, they'll be like, Brother Chesley. I'm like, yeah, hermano. He's like, I got the suit from Burlington for $4 because I used a coupon. <laughs> Excited about it. But you know what? I wish more believers would have the same mindset, which is be generous, but save your money. You see the world's all about flashy stuff and they have shirts that say drip on it and all this other stuff. That's great for them, but most of them can't afford that stuff and are miserable because of that stuff. The number one cause of divorce which shocked me when I worked as an associate pastor at a church is financial stress. Because when finances ain't working, nothing else in your life is working. But I want to encourage you with this as believers. The Bible says that God opens up the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing on you that there's not room enough to receive it. So be a tither. Be a person who gives. It leaves a legacy and God blesses it. Be a person who works. God blesses the work of your hands. And be a person who gives to yourself, which means put a little bit of money away each month. Start with whatever you can. It doesn't have to be a lot, but be a person who saves. $100 a month over 12 months is $1,200. God will bless you for it. I just want to pray over you this morning. And then if you need prayer after the service, like I said, I will pray with you. Father, I thank you for your beautiful family, Father God. This is your family. This is your house, Lord. We thank you, Pastor Daniel's getting strong and healthy. We declare life and strength in his body. And Lord, for everybody else here, Lord, I've declared health in their bodies. You said you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from all afflictions. So I rebuke arthritis, diabetes, high blood pressure, whatever situations people are facing, Father God. I thank you. Healing is the children's bread. I speak life and health and strength in these bodies. And Lord, for every believer here, I thank you. You bless the work of their hands. Lord, you said you give them so much favor that their enemies want to bless them and not know why. I declare their jobs are blessed. Their finances are blessed. Their houses and cars are paid off, Father God. And I thank you for pay raises and promotions coming soon, Father God, because promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It comes from you, and we thank you for it, Father God. And Lord, I thank you the people here are leaving legacies. They're living epistles read and known by all men. The people see their lives and want to know more about you. I thank you this is a house full of fruitful believers. In Jesus' name, amen.